Hello, this is Morel Bernard with the continuing story of Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights, and please subscribe, please share. Yesterday afternoon, set in misty and cold, I had half a mind to spend it by my study fire instead of wading through heath and mud to Wuthering Heights. On coming up from dinner, however, I dine between twelve and one o'clock. The housekeeper, a matronly lady taken as a fixture along with the house, could not or would not comprehend my request that I might be served at five. On mounting the stairs with this lazy intention and stepping into the room, I saw a servant girl on her knees, surrounded by brushes and coal scuttles, and raising an infernal dust as she extinguished the flames with heaps of cinders. This spectacle drove me back immediately. I took my hat, and after a four miles walk, arrived at Heathcliff's garden gate, just in time to escape the first feathery flakes of a snow shower. On that bleak hill top, the earth was hard with a black frost and the air made me shiver through every limb. Being unable to remove the chain, I jumped over and running up the flagged causeway, bordered with straggling gooseberry bushes, knocked vainly for admittance till my knuckles tingled and the dogs howled. Wretched inmates, I ejaculated mentally, you deserve perpetual isolation from your species for your churlish inhospitality. At least, I would not keep my doors barred in the daytime. I don't care. I will get in. So resolved, I grasped the latch and shook it vehemently. Vinegar-faced Josie projected his head from a round window of the barn. What are ye for? he shouted. The master's down in the fold. Go round by the end of the lake if ye want to speak to him. Is there nobody inside to open the door? I hallowed irresponsibly. There's no bout, missus and she'll not open to make you flaysome this night. Why, cannot you tell her whom I am, eh, hey, Joseph? Norny me, I have no hut, muttered the head, vanishing. The snow began to drive thickly. I seized the handle to essay another trial, when a young man, without coat and shouldering a pitchfork, appeared in the yard behind. He hailed me to follow him, and after marching through a wash house and a paved area containing a cold shed, pump and pigeon cot, we at length arrived in the huge, warm, cheerful apartment where I was formerly received. It glowed delightfully in the radiance of an immense fire, compounded of coal, peat and wood, and near the table, laid for a plentiful evening meal. I was pleased to observe the missus, an individual whose existence I had never previously suspected. I bowed and waited, thinking she would bid me take a seat. She looked at me, leaning back in her chair, and remained motionless and mute. Rough weather, I remarked. I'm afraid, Mrs. Heathcliff, the door must bear the consequence of your servant's leisure attendance. I had hard work to make them hear me. She never opened her mouth. I stared. She stared also, at any rate. She kept her eyes on me in a cool, regardless manner, exceedingly embarrassing and disagreeable. Sit down said the young man gruffly. You'll be in soon. I obeyed and hemmed and called the villain Juno, 
who dined at this second interview to move the extreme tip of her tail in token of owning my acquaintance. A beautiful animal, I commenced again. Do you intend parting with the little ones, madame? They are not mine, said the amiable hostess, more repellingly than Heathcliff himself could have replied. Ah, your favourites are among these, I continued, turning to an obscure cushion full of something like cats. A strange choice of favourites, she observed scornfully. Unluckily, it was a heap of dead rabbits. I hemmed once more and drew closer to the herd, repeating my comment on the wildness of the evening. You should not have come out, she said, rising and reaching from the chimney piece two of the painted canister. Her position before was sheltered from the light. Now, I had a distinct view of her whole figure and countenance. She was slender, and apparently scarcely past girlhood. An admirable form and the most exquisite little face that I have ever had the pleasure of beholding. Small features, very fair, flaxen ringlets, or rather golden, hanging loose on her delicate neck and eyes. Had they been agreeable in expression, that would have been irresistible. Fortunately for my susceptible heart, the only sentiment they evinced how hovered between scorn and a kind of desperation, singularly unnatural to be detected there. The canisters were almost out of her reach. I made a motion to Ada. She turned upon me as a miser might turn if anyone attempted to assist him in counting his gold. I don't want your help, she snapped. I can get them for myself. I beg your pardon, I hastened to reply. Were you asked to tea, she demanded, tying an apron over her neat black frock and standing with a spoonful of the leaf poised over the pot. I shall be glad to have a cup, I answered. Were you asked, she repeated. No, I said, half smiling. You are the proper person to ask me. She flung the tea back, spoon and all, and resumed her chair in a pet. Her forehead corrugated and her red upper lip pushed out like a child's, ready to cry. Meanwhile, the young man had slung on to his person a decidedly shabby upper garment and erecting himself before the blaze looked down on me from the corner of his eyes, for all the world as if there were some mortal feud on a venge between us. I began to doubt whether he were a servant or not. His dress and speech were both rude, entirely devoid of the superiority observable in Mr. and Mrs. Heathcliff. His thick brown curls were rough and uncultivated. His whiskers encroached bearishly over his cheeks, and his hands were embrowned like those of a common labourer. Still, his bearing was free, almost haughty, and he showed none of a domestic assiduity in attending on the lady of the house. In the absence of clear proofs of his condition, I deemed it best to abstain from noticing his curious conduct, and Five minutes afterwards, the entrance of Heathcliff relieved me, in some measure from my uncomfortable state. You see, sir, I am come, according to promise, I exclaimed, assuming the cheerful, and I fear I shall be weather-bound for half an hour, if you can afford me shelter during that space. Half an hour, he said, shaking the white flakes from his clothes. I wonder you should select the thick of a snowstorm to ramble about in. Do you know that you run a risk of being lost in the marshes? People familiar with these moors often miss their road on such evenings, and I can tell you there is no chance of a change at present. 
Perhaps I can get a guide among your lads, and he might stay at the Grange till morning. Could you spare me one? No, I could not. Oh, indeed. Well, then, I must trust to my own sagacity. Um. Are you going to make the tea? demanded the off of the shabby coat, shifting his ferocious gaze from me to the young lady. Is he to have any? she asked, appealing to Heathcliff. Get it ready, will you? was the answer, uttered so savagely that I started. The tone in which the words were said revealed a genuine bad nature. I no longer felt inclined to call Heathcliff a capital fellow. When the preparations were finished, he invited me with, Now, sir, bring forward your chair. And we all, including the rustic youth, drew round the table. An austere silence prevailing while we discussed our meal. I thought, if I had caused the cloud, it was my duty to make an effort to dispel it. They could not every day sit so grim and taciturn, and it was impossible, however ill-tempered they might be, that the universal scowl they wore was their everyday countenance. It is strange, I began in the interval of swallowing one cup of tea and receiving another. Uh, It is strange how custom can mould our taste and ideas. Many could not imagine the existence of happiness in a life of such complete exile from the world as you spent, Mr. Heathcliff. Yet, I'll venture to say that, surrounded by your family, and with your amiable lady as the presiding genius over your home and heart. My amiable lady, he interrupted, with an almost diabolical sneer on his face. Where is she, my amiable lady? Mrs. Heathcliff, your wife, I mean. Well, uh, yes, oh, you would intimate that her spirit has taken the post of ministering angel and guards the fortune of Wuthering Heights, even when her body is gone. Is that it? Perceiving myself in a blunder, I attempted to correct it. I might have seen there was too great a disparity between the ages of the parties to make it likely that they were man and wife. One was about forty, a period of mental vigour at which men seldom cherish the delusion of being married for love by girls. That dream is reserved for the solace of our declining years. The other did not look seventeen. Then it flashed upon me, the clown at my elbow, who is drinking his tea out of a basin and eating his bread with unwashed hands, may be her husband. Heathcliff Jr., of course. Here is a consequence of being buried alive. She has thrown herself away upon that bore from sheer ignorance that better individuals existed. A sad pity. I must beware how I cause her to regret her choice. The last reflection may seem conceited, it was not. My neighbour struck me as bordering on repulsive. I knew through experience that I was tolerably attractive. Mrs Heathcliff is my daughter-in-law, said Heathcliff, corroborating my summarise. He turned as he spoke. A peculiar look in her direction. A look of hatred, unless he has the most perverse set of facial muscles that will not, like those of other people, interpret the language of his soul. Ah, certainly, I see now. You are the favoured professor of the beneficent fairy, I remarked, turning to my neighbour. This was worse than before. The youth grew crimson and clenched his fist. With every appearance of a meditated assault, but he seemed to recollect himself presently and smothered down the storm in a brutal curse, muttered on my behalf, which, however, I took care not to notice. 
unhappy in your conjectures, sir, observed my host. We, neither of us, have the privilege of owning your good fairy. Her mate is dead. I said she was my daughter-in-law. Therefore, she must have married my son. And this young man is not my son, assuredly. Heathcliff smiled again, as if it were rather too bold a jest to attribute the paternity of that there to him. My name is Harrington Earnshaw, growled the other, and I'm counsel you to respect it. I've shown no disrespect, was my reply, laughing internally at the dignity with which he announced himself. He fixed his eye on me longer than I cared to return the stare, for fear I might be tempted either to box his ears or render my hilarity audible. I began to feel unmistakably out of place in that pleasant family circle. The dismal spiritual atmosphere overcame and more than neutralised the glowing physical comforts around me. And I resolved to be cautious how I ventured onto those rafters a third time. The business of eating being concluded and no one uttering a word of sociable conversation, I approached the window to examine the weather. A sorrowful sight. I saw dark night coming down prematurely and sky and hills mingled in one bitter whirl of wind and suffocating snow. I didn't think it possible for me to get home now without a guide. I could not help exclaiming. The roads will be blurred, buried already. And if they were there, I could scarcely distinguish a foot in advance. Harton, drive those dozen sheep into the barn porch. They'll be covered if left in the fold all night. And put a plank before them, said Heathcliff. How must I do? I continued with rising irritation. There was no reply to my question. And on looking round, I saw only Joseph bringing in a pail of porridge for the dogs. And Mrs. Heathcliff leaning over the fire, diverting herself with burning a bundle of matches which had fallen from the chimney piece as she restored the tea canister to its place. The former, when he had deposited his burden, took a critical survey of the room and in cracked tones grated out, Ah! Wonder how you can finish to stand there, idleness and war, when all of them gone on. But you're an out, and it's no use talking. You'll never mend over your ways, but go right, you devil, like your mother afore you. I imagine for a moment that this piece of eloquence was addressed to me, and sufficiently enraged stepped towards the aged rascal with an intention of kicking him out of the door. Mrs. Heathcliff, however, checked me by her answer. You scandalous old hypocrite, she replied. Are you not afraid of being carried away boldly whenever you mention the devil's name? I warn you to refrain from provoking me, or I'll ask your abundation of a special favour. Stop. Look here, Joseph, she continued, taking a long, dark book from a shelf. I'll show you how far I progressed in the black art. I shall soon be competent to make a clear house of it. The red cow didn't die by chance. And your rheumatism can hardly be reckoned among providential visitations. Oh, wicked, wicked, gasped the elder. May the Lord deliver us from evil. May the Lord deliver us from evil. Do join me. Join me for the next video of Wuthering Heights.
And please subscribe and please share. Join me for the next video of Wuthering Heights. See you then.